Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this talk on global economic trends sponsored by the independent asset manager, Lupus Alpha. I'm Melinda Crane, and it is a great pleasure to moderate today's deep dive into the outlook for Europe with one of the world's leading institutional investors. Robert Wallace is Chief Executive Officer of Stanford Management Company, overseeing Stanford University's $38 billion investment portfolio, which under his oversight has become one of the best performing endowments in the U.S., Formerly Chief Executive Officer of the London-based Alta Advisors, he began his investment career at Yale Investment Office following a 16-year career as a professional ballet dancer at leading companies including American Ballet Theatre and Boston Ballet. So Rob Wallace, apropos ballet, many observers here in Europe see the EU's struggle with high energy prices, inflation, and political uncertainty as akin to dancing on the edge of a volcano. What's your perspective as a US-based investor who knows Europe well? Sure, well, it's very nice to be with you. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Certainly, I think the uh, geopolitical and macroeconomic climate in, uh, in Europe is concerning. Uh, the risks are elevated uh, versus uh, most periods of, of, of time. And uh, as investors, I think it's prudent to, to try to take account of that uh, when designing your portfolio strategy. I would, I would add that Europe is not the only region of the world that is under um, some uh, cloud of uncertainty with regard to uh, macroeconomic and geopolitical uh, conditions. Certainly the U.S. inflation is as high or higher in the U.S. as it is in Europe. There are many things to worry about uh, in, in Asia, and at least in terms of the relationship between the West and China, uh, and of course the, 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 the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine is uh, sending the whole world into a little bit of a, uh, a, a tailspin on its own. So there, there are conditions across the world right now that are challenging. Uh, not just in Europe, uh, but I do think that the, uh, that the backdrop of uncertainty in Europe makes it challenging uh, to know exactly what to do uh, as an investor in, in that region. So let's talk about uh, what you're doing in the face of the fact that that cloud of uncertainty is particularly thick in Europe. A number of analysts say that the U.S. can still avoid a recession, but that Europe well may not be able to do so. The EU Commission has downgraded its growth forecast for 2023 just this week. What does all that mean for Stanford's investment strategy? How are you adjusting your portfolio? Well, remember that Stanford's endowment is a perpetual endowment. And so we have a we operate with a very long-term investment horizon. And although, of course, uh, recessions are not good things uh, in general for uh, investment portfolios, including long-term investment portfolios. We have the ability to look through uh, periods of economic weakness. And so when we look uh, at any situation that's complex and, and, and potentially uh, risky, uh, such as uh, is, is the case in Europe right now, we're trying to look through uh, that period of uncertainty and try to use the dislocations that may be starting to happen right now uh, in companies, public and private, or assets uh, to our advantage. And one of the things that I would uh, advocate any uh, investor, institutional or, or otherwise, that has an adequate time horizon is to not be afraid to lean into periods of, of, of uncertainty and dislocations because really valuable businesses tend to gain market share in periods of economic weakness. Um, valuable assets become more valuable, but you might be able to buy them at a discount. Uh, when everybody else is is a little bit fearful, uh, when there's a little bit of panic in the air. And so uh, having the discipline to maintain your time horizon when other people are getting nervous is a key part of what we do at Stanford University. And I would uh, advocate that most uh, investors, as long as they have uh, a sufficiently long time horizon and no near-term liabilities, try to do the same thing. In other words, you're telling us that in uh, a crisis also lie opportunities. Can you say anything specifically about which particular sectors or industries you think could be of particular interest in Europe, given what the, the, the conditions we currently see? 
Yes, I can I can add, give you a few thoughts. First of all, I think we see technology becoming um, more important and more investable uh, in Europe in general. And uh, the venture uh, capital ecosystem in Europe is becoming more interesting to us. Uh, it's always had some some important companies that have uh, grown grown up through it, uh, but more are being built and being launched now. And we expect, uh, and certainly we hope, and we expect that that will continue to happen in Europe. And and that's a really important thing. We're just still, I believe, at the early in the early innings of having technology really trans transform uh, many uh, parts of the economy. I mean, we're Mark Andreessen, a U.S. venture capitalist, said software is eating the world. He made that comment 10 years ago, but you know we're still in the early stages of having software really transform the way that uh, economies work and business is done. So I think a lot of that um, creative destruction will, will arise in Europe and it will be very good for the European economy and for the world as well. And I think it's something that we're paying close attention to at Stanford. The other thing that's clearly happening in Europe or will be happening in Europe and is gonna happen, I believe globally, is some um, significant amount of deglobalization. We've had you know, 20 or 30 years of globalization, but now we're gonna have a period where supply lines are shortened, where uh, key, key parts of the economy are brought back onshore, such as energy in Europe. And I think one thing that's clearly gonna be uh, an important investment theme uh, for Europe is how, how, how it uh, achieves energy security and energy independence and doesn't need to rely upon the flow of hydrocarbons from Russia, for instance. And so I think maybe some conventional energy is going to be interesting for a period of time in Europe, but also clearly uh, the transition to uh, cleaner and more sustainable forms of energy is going to be accelerated uh, or should be accelerated. And I think that that will present some opportunities for investors as long as they're not uh, priced to perfection. And in that context, can you perhaps also say a word about Europe and ESG? Because I know that you have been a strong advocate of embedding ESG more firmly in Stanford's investment decisions. Do you see opportunities in that area when you look toward Europe? I think so, though the way we think of it is, is less of, uh, of having an ESG overlay, but really acknowledging and incorporating into our day-to-day -day investment work that environmental, social, and governance issues impact economic value in the long run. Since most of almost everything we do has a, a time horizon of you know five to ten years or longer, um, we really need to be concerned with how the businesses and the assets we own uh, are treating uh, stakeholders, whether they're human or environmental stakeholders. And so, uh, I, I think what you know what we view as um, uh, an appropriate posture regarding ESG is that it's part of every decision we make, and it and it really has has always been. Uh, and for instance, I think that Europe is probably uh, ahead of most of the rest of the world in terms of its acknowledgement of the externalities associated with carbon in the atmosphere, uh, and those are true economic costs that are not being really reflected in in market prices for hydrocarbons. And so. I think the you know the carbon pricing regime that we see in Europe and we see a little bit of it in other places in the world is probably a very important uh, thing to have uh, happen and will likely continue to be a major feature of uh, the European economy and that I think probably uh, will help investors like Stanford allocate capital um, more effectively. In fact, that is an opinion that's shared by the European Central Bank, which said quite recently that it does now plan to start uh, looking at ESG factors more carefully in its own uh, asset purchases, but also uh, in its supervision. Uh, the e ECB today raised interest rates for the first time in over 10 years and did so quite robustly. Do you think they got it about right? You know, I don't know. I'm not. I'm skeptical of my own ability to um, forecast complex macroeconomic variables, and so I don't know. I thought certainly there's you know very high inflation in the eurozone, and I think that I think it's a, a credible uh, first step, and 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 might well have been uh, necessary to to do the 50 bit uh, hike. At the same time, there you know this new uh, um, anti fragmentation uh, policy, the TPI policy that they put in place. Is trying to battle the effects, uh, the the you know the unwanted effects of higher interest rates in some of the peripheral countries, and so I think the ECB, because of the design of the of the of the European 
European Monetary Union is fighting um, battles on both sides at the same time. It's kind of a very delicate balancing point it's trying to hit. And so it seemed like a, a reasonable step uh, to me uh, to take, but I, I know that there are a lot of other uh, issues that the ECB must also consider. And finally, if you would, we've talked about opportunities. Uh, let's go back to uh, that cloud of uncertainty you mentioned at the outset. What are the main risks that you think investors should be watching when they're looking toward Europe and uh, also uh, investability here in Europe? Do you think that uh, European companies are likely to find themselves at a disadvantage uh, in terms of attracting investment due to that cloud? I think certainly companies that were heavily engaged in business with Russia are going to be, are, are already at and will continue to be at a huge disadvantage. Uh, and uh, Sanford has never invested in Russia, at least not under uh, my watch in the last seven years. And uh, nor in my 18 years as a chief investment officer, have I ever invested a dollar into Russia directly. So I think I think it's wise to be uh, careful about uh, those sorts of investments that really are quite tied uh, to Russia, which I expect to be troublesome for uh, for some time, um, and and sort of unpredictable in a in a you know in a, from a risk perspective where you could really lose all of your money very very easily. So I think uh, that type of binary outcome is difficult to underwrite as an investor, uh, and so I'd be very careful of that. I think in general. Um, high quality businesses uh, and high quality assets could be real estate, for instance, um, that are well located and uh, have a strong, uh, enduring appeal are going to come through this period of weakness and uncertainty stronger. And so I would advise people to look for quality, look for businesses that have some material degree of pricing power and the ability to pass on cost um, and can also take advantage of um, weaknesses in their competitors. And so to gain a little bit of market share in a, in a difficult time, but I think it could be a difficult macroeconomic backdrop for, for a meaningful amount of time. And so you want to put your capital to work in higher quality companies, public and private, and higher quality physical assets. Thank you very much, Rob Wallace, for these very interesting and very important insights. I know that uh, our audience will be very grateful that you took the time to speak with us. And dear ladies and gentlemen, we hope to see you at the next talk on global economic trends. Until then, I say a warm word of thanks to all those who have uh, joined us and, uh, and wish you well until we meet again. Goodbye.